sack of music copying supplies. Mm. Are we online now? Oh, we are. Hello, Houston. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everyone. I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight to this DG Conservatory seminar. We're very excited that so many of you are interested in these musical seminars we're putting together. As always, if you have any ideas, if you have people you want to hear from, please let me know. In case you don't know, I'm Terry Stratton, Director of Education and Outreach here at the Guild, and I put together these seminar series. Uh, my email address, tstratton at dramatistguild.com. Any ideas, please send them my way. I really appreciate them. Um, if you want to take a moment to you know, tweet that you're here or check in on Facebook and let everyone know that you're here, after you do that, please put your phones on vibrate or on silent. Um, we're going to try not making you turn them off. But please don't um, audio record on your own phone or take any photographs at this time, OK? The panel is going to speak for about an hour amongst themselves, and then we'll open it up to questions. I ask that when you ask a question to please stand up and speak loudly so our internet audience can hear that as well. Okay? And we'll be, um, this will be archived starting uh, either tomorrow or Monday, so if there's something you want to replay, you can go to New Play TV, I'm sorry, livestream.com backslash New Play TV, and you can watch this plus all of our other DG Conservatory events that we've had this year. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator, who will introduce the panel, the, I'm sorry, supremely talented, but also supremely nice and wonderful person, Mr. Stephen Clary. Well, we're, we're really excited uh, that you're here with us today, uh, both in person and virtually, you know, through the little <laughs> camera in Wyoming and other places. <laughs> and uh, we, we had done one of these panels on uh, uh, music composition, music, music theater, and tech uh, two years ago in, in 2010, and I was uh, making a little list of all the things that had changed technically for me just in two years, and it's a huge list. I mean, it's like gigantic, and uh, last time uh, we, we had a really great time, and we, we learned a lot, so, you know, take notes, uh, think of questions, and you know, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, the, the panel today, uh, we have some members who had joined us before who are rejoining us today, so we could do a follow-up conversation. Uh, but so much uh, has changed in both theater and theater tech in two years, uh, so I think we, we have a lot to talk about today. So uh, to my right uh, is uh, Mark Menard of uh, Acme Sound Partners. Uh, when we did the, the first panel, we didn't have a, a sound designer. And a lot of people kept raising their hands and asking questions about how the idea of sound design and sound production uh, interfaced with dramatic storytelling and musical storytelling. And we thought rather than you know being middleman this time that we would actually get uh, one of the most cutting edge uh, sound designers here in New York City uh, to join us. And uh, Mark, uh, uh, he and Acme have done such amazing work. Uh, recently we worked on uh, the revival of Ragtime and then a couple of weeks ago, we had a chance to re, uh, have a big concert version of Ragtime at Avery Fisher, which was a com completely different kettle of fish. What? You know, designing sound for that, that you know, very different kind of a hall. So in three hours. In three hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was no like tech period for, for that one night only event. But uh, uh, Mark, uh, he, he's done amazing work in Acme. Just in recent years, uh, if if you look at the scope of the kind of work that they've done, uh, they were nominated uh, for the Tony for Hair which is you know, the seminal rock, op rock uh, opera, and also for the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. So I couldn't think of sonically two different kinds of shows and two, two different assignments you know, to, to design sound for. So you know, I'd like to hear more about that you know, once we get rolling. But uh, we're, we're, great. we're really happy that um, Mark is with us. Uh, to Mark's right uh, is Michael Starabin who uh, is a two-time Tony Award-winning orchestrator uh, uh, for Next to Normal and for uh, Stephen Sondheim and James, uh, oh, sorry, and <laughs> John Weidman's uh, Assassins. And uh, we've worked together on many shows, uh, beginning with uh, Once on this Island, and most recently with uh, The Glorious Ones and on a film project. Uh, still to appear. Still to appear. Uh, it's a film version of, of my first show, Lucky Stiff. So. Uh, the techniques uh, the, that we used in the recording studio for the film and that we use live 
uh, a lot of them are different, and a lot of them are surprisingly similar. So I think you know that's something that might be interesting uh, because Michael's worked uh, had an extensive career in orchestrating for the theater, but also for film as well. And he's also a gifted composer as well. So you know he, he's sort of like the all all around guy <laughs> at this table. Uh, to, to Michael's uh, when Michael was with us for the first panel as well. So uh, to to Michael's right is uh, Alex Lacamoire. Uh, who is also a Tony-winning uh, orchestrator for uh, In the Heights. And uh, Alex was represented on Broadway uh, this season by the new production of Annie, and also by Bring It On. And again, can you think of two different shows? <laughs> and Annie and Bring It On. And, uh, it, it's interesting because uh, the tech stuff uh, that Alex and company uh, used this season for, for Bring It On is, is really, it's really cutting edge stuff. Uh, it brings a lot of studio techniques. Uh, for those of you who didn't, uh, who weren't lucky to, to see the show this season, uh, it really featured a, a really interesting pop and hip hop score, and uh, so a lot of the, the hip hop sounds and technology uh, were, were brought fully into the theater, and, and I think very successfully. So I, I know that that'll be something uh, that we'd like uh, to hear Alex talk about. And then to Alex's right, uh, also on the very first uh, and, um, panel for the for the tech here, uh, is Emily Grishman. Who I, I think it's safe to say that you're. What's the female version of Dean? Doyen. The Doyen of music. <laughs> <laughs> Not only here in New York, but but like uh, she is everywhere. She's literally everywhere. I think I think you have a, several doppelgangers running around. But Emily, I wish. Yeah, but Emily, uh, she's had such an extensive uh, career uh, doing music copying in the theater. And we, we first worked on uh, my first show at Playwrights Horizons, Lucky Stiff. And that was in the day of uh, oil skins. And, onion skin. And, and, yeah, it, onion skin, yeah. <laughs> so long ago, I forgot, it's, it's onion skin and, and, and uh, handwritten. So uh, it's, she's, she's really gone the gamut from you know, beautifully handwritten scores to uh, cutting edge uh, computer generated scores and parts. So it'll be interesting to hear how, uh, how Emily you know, fits into to what we do. So um, sort of how we were framing this was, uh, the composer and the lyricist and the book writer, they're you know, basically in their little rooms you know, uh, together and separately and they come up with an idea. And how does the, the initial notion of what a song and what a theater score can be, how does that translate into uh, the final product, you know, what we see in the theater? And, uh, and how uh, technology is changing our lives both creatively and uh, personally. You know? Can I ask you a question to start? If we're starting from the sure. songwriting sure. aspect, how how filled out do you feel a demo of a song needs to be? I mean, that first stage, which is where technology is very available to a composer now. Yeah. Um, and the reason I ask is when I get sent, you know, demos saying, "Here, we want you to orchestrate this." I find it very it gets in the way for someone to have done a huge MIDI orchestration, which will never be achievable, certainly for a show that's going off Broadway with five pieces. Right. And here's the string section and this brass. And it, it also hides what the writing they've done. And so I'm just wondering what your feeling is with the scores that you, you know, you're yeah. writing now. Yeah, days. well, I, originally you know, I, I came to New York in the fall of 82. And so uh, back in that day, uh, you know, we actually would get together as a group of people in a room around a, an upright piano, sort of like, you know, uh, not that far removed from Tin Pan Alley, frankly. And, you know, and we'd play the song and we'd sing the song and we'd discuss, you know, the style of the score, the style of the music, what it would be. <laughs> and um, uh, oftentimes there weren't demos, but even back in the day, like, it was acceptable to have a piano vocal demo, which basically is you go into, you know, your studio and then later your home studio. And you would just do a very simple rendering of the song, oftentimes with just a piano track and a vocal, or if it were you know, a choral number, you'd try to you know, mock up you know, what the vocal parts might be, because that's important for the orchestrator, or orchestrator to know is what the vocal texture is, because what uh, he does really interfaces with that. So uh, back in the 80s, it was really kind of primitive. You know, it was a piano mm -hmm. vocal demo or piano vocal DX7 <laughs> demo, you know, which was like the, you know, the really the, the new kid on the block in terms of you know, synthesis. And uh, recently, uh, um, I've noticed that a lot of young composers' demos are what Michael is describing, where they're fully midi up the wazoo. You know? and, and actually, a young composer came up to me and he said, I'm trying to sell my 
or tried to get a producer introduced uh, or interested in my piece, and it's uh, I, I'm thinking of uh, hiring an uh, an orchestra from Czechoslovakia to do a 65 piece orchestration <laughs> of, of my new score because it's going to be so exciting, and you know we'll have strings that we'll never have and brass that we'll never have. And I'm thinking, well, how does that represent your piece, at least your piece at, you know, uh, at, at a Broadway-sized house, you know, I've never heard of the 65-piece minimum of you, you know, <laughs> so, so, I mean, it's, it's everything in between, but I, I know Michael's point is well taken, because I think a lot of the times, uh, if the composer gives too much information, then it doesn't leave a lot of room for your original ideas to, to interface. Or for, or for, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. for the producer to imagine where it might go. Yeah, exactly. As well. Exactly. Yeah, along the same lines as Michael, it's just very confusing when you know you have five pieces and you get this fully orchestrated piece and you're, you're like, what am I going to do? Is there, are, are the keyboards going to play strings? Is there going to be like all, a whole bunch of keyboard right. patches to, to play all this stuff? Is the brass going to be there? Because right. we don't have brass players. Right, right. We're going to play double reads off keyboards? Yeah. Uh, not so much. Yeah, <laughs> we were talking before uh, we entered the room and, uh, and Mark had said, you know, it really helps the sound designer even at an early stage to get some sort of a mock-up demo or MP3 recording to say, sort of, this is the sonic scape of the piece. So he can begin thinking, you know, is this the Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, or is this hair? You know, exactly. because it really affects Well, that's it's exactly, because it starts us on a path that is is the right path. We go, because then we know sonically, um, we're designing a sound system, and it's very large orchestrally, yeah. or it's very rock and roll, and the systems are completely different in yeah. that regard. Well, Michael, like, what's your idea of, of, a, of, of the kind of demo that is most helpful to you as an orchestrator? I think for the most part, piano. However, if the score is based on pop feels, then, then obviously you need a rhythm section. But, <coughs> but the, the idea of a demo is to express your playwriting choices and your songwriting choices, not to show a finished product. Because right. this is a collaborative art form, and on the way to getting to a production, many <laughs> things are going to change. Directors are going to ask you to do something with the song. Choreographer is going to ask for dance music to go into it. And so the more finished you make it, the more harder it is for everyone to imagine it being pulled apart and being used as a piece of plate writing. It needs to be, yeah. to a certain extent, plastic right. Right. You know, as you move forward so that it can be molded a little. I mean, do you find the demos uh, in the theater world are different from the demos that you hear for the film world? The demos you hear, well, the overdone demos are not, oh, the, the, theatrical music isn't necessarily big symphonic music, isn't necessarily the sound of movie music. It can be at times, but it isn't always. And there's this thing like to take a pop ballad and do it like a big, huge pop ballad for the radio. And that doesn't work in the theater. A ballad for the theater usually needs to start softer and simpler to come out of the fact that there's dialogue being spoken right. and we're going into a musical moment gradually. That doesn't, and so you don't want to overlay the exact pop feel that's correct. If you're gonna go for that pop feel, you've gotta work your way to it, allowing the audience, audience's ear to find their way there and go with you on the journey. So, I, I mean, for my money, it also gets, as an orchestrator, it just gets in my way to hear what they've done. Right. Do you know, because right. I'm going to want to do something for their, for their composition that I think is appropriate. And they may have some good ideas that I'll use, but I have to, like, push them away. And sometimes right. I'll push away good stuff because I'm so busy just getting to the nut of the song itself. Well, the, the other thing that Michael does so well is he really thinks, you do, you, th you think as a musical dramatist, because it's not like, oh, this is a really cool tune. Isn't this like, doesn't this sound great, this ballad? You know, really what we do is, you know, we're musical dramatists. We're dealing with a, a human being feeling a certain emotion in time, uh, in a moment. And, and, and so much of what we do is in context. It's what is the scene about? How does, uh, what happens in the course of the scene affect the song? Or if the song is the scene, you know, dramatically, where is the turnaround? How musically do you highlight right. what that turnaround is? You know, so... You know, oftentimes, oh, then you get to doing the original cast album, and then we go back to right. square one because you realize that for most uh, cast albums, especially with integrated theater scores, it's not just about a collection of you know twelve songs. It's about musical scenes. It's about musical sequences, 
and you, you know we have to rethink, as you know, you yeah. know how to rework that. I mean, you had a really interesting thing talking about uh, assassins going from the first Playwrights Horizons sort of well, the, mock up the, the, to, to, to the, the or to the recording to the the very first recording was orchestrated for that recording for the RCA recording. It wasn't done for the theater, so I went. Fine, I'm going to do it for 45 pieces, <laughs> which I did, and I'd use different orchestras for different songs, and it was great. And then they said, okay, give us a version for eight pieces based on that. Yeah. <laughs> and I reduced it, and it was horrible. And then I got, luckily got to do it again in 2004, an actual theatrical orchestration for the first time, which was different. Because I remember the, the Playwrights Horizons, the Jerry Zachs production, and, yeah. and it was. Uh, uh, Paul Ford on piano, Michael himself on, on keyboards, and Paul Gemignani hitting the drum. Right. You know, and that was the or that was the orchestration, and then it went to the forty-five piece, and then then I guess the London, the Dunmar. Version. The Dunmar was based on that eight-piece reduction, which yeah. is not very good, and then we got to do the new one for fourteen, which actually works. And in after theater. all, and so after those four or more orchestrations, you finally got that Tony, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. For all the war, stars for all the war wounds, getting it right finally. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. one of the interesting things uh, that Alex does is uh, he works, uh, I think this is fair to say, on a lot of pop-based scores. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, uh, more traditionalists, you know, are used to scoring up, you know, by hand or now computer, uh, you know, piano vocal scores. But I know that you uh, work in many different ways that involve other technologies, other ways of capturing musical ideas that aren't necessarily you know, written down on a piece of paper. Can you speak to that about a bit? Yeah, yeah, I mostly dealt with that a lot and bring it on this past year. Um, some of that started because of Lin-Manuel's demos, and speaking of demos, that, that's kind of how he works on a lot of his stuff. Um, a lot of his songs had effects that can only be created on a sequencer, on, uh, you know, he would use logic essentially. Uh, there's a particular song in the show called Do Your Own Thing, and the basic riff of that is built around what's called an arpeggiator. It's a sound that goes and it's a sound that I, at first, wanted to put on the live keyboard. I'm like, oh, that would be awesome because, you know, it would sound so cool. And I tried to make it such that the guy could hit just like one note at a time and every time he hit it, it would, it would double strike. And then when we got to Atlanta, we tried it and we could just never sync it up with the click track. And if the guy hit it like just like a hair of a 30 second at the wrong moment, it just wouldn't groove and wouldn't lock in. So it was a bit of a learning process in bring it on to learn that, you know what, there's certain things that were designed to be played by a computer that need to be played by a computer in order to come out right. So one of the things we did is that we had to leave that on the track and then build the band around it. Um, so yeah, we, we use Logic a lot. I, I use Logic a lot for, um, uh, for my stuff because it just help, helps me to hear it. And uh, one thing that I know that Michael's really good at too is being specific about the sounds that he wants to hear. And you know, I used to be much more general uh, about what kinds of sounds I wanted keyboards to play. And I would tell Randy Cohen, who's you know, the guy who I call for all my keyboard programming, I would say, okay, Randy, give me like a belly synth here, give me like a, uh, you know, a whooshy whoosh here. And then again, we were in Atlanta and tried that route, and every time we heard the sound, it just wasn't quite what I had in my head. So right. I learned that I then needed to get a proper synth, get the actual Yamaha motif sound, find the very whooshy whoosh that I wanted, and tell Randy, give me this whooshy whoosh, or give me this bell sound, because, you know, it, uh, I needed to hear what happening in my head and how to come out the right way. Because when you just give a, you know, a programmer that kind of uh, broad range, you might not always get the sound you're looking for. So it needed to be exactly right. So, so when you're talking about like, creating really specific electronic sounds, yeah. uh, as opposed to you know, a clarinet hitting a B flat, mm -hmm. how, how do you get the literal physical sound to, to, to Randy? Uh, you know, it's worked on Bring It On because we, I knew what sound, what keyboard he was going to be using. Ah. I knew what rack he was going to be using. And he said, listen, when you're in the pit, the keyboards will have this phantom rack and they will have this motif keyboard. So I, he literally lent me those very keyboards in that rack. I had it sitting in my house next to my computer. I would sit there by the dial and like find a pad and hit the chord, nope, next pad. Nope, that's not it either. Next pad. It's just literally sitting it's there. And trial by error until you found the exact sound that you were imagining. Yeah. Sometimes for 10 minutes just to find the right wow. sound. And sometimes 10 minutes after you realize, you know what, maybe that's not the part I'm looking for either. So it's a slow going process, but yeah. in the end, I think it, it, it gave me what it was that I had in my head. And it allowed me to like hear it ahead of time and know that this is the sound that I'm going to be getting when I get to the end. That's great. One of, the, one of the things that's interesting that we used to all have to borrow the synth that was coming in and find our sounds on it. We're using soft synths now, which are plugins 
Um, usually you can run them in logic or something. And the great thing about that is I can take a patch, open it up, and go, oh, I like this, but I'm going to change this envelope here, do it a little bit here, throw it into Dropbox, which we'll talk about Dropbox if any of you no longer know about it. Um, and suddenly I'm able to immediately send sounds back and forth between Randy. And because it's a synth, it's uh, not a sampler. And also it's not using, it's using virtually no memory mm. for the, all the different patches I want. I think we should at this point do a little sidebar because there might be a member or two here and certainly some members watching the stream. Uh, Mike, would you care to explain what Logic is? Uh, log logic is a computer sequencer, music workstation you might call it, but uh, uh, other ones are known as, uh, as Cubase, Performer, GarageBand, Garage Band, which is uh, now a simpler version of, of Logic. But if, if you're a GarageBand user, you might want to graduate up to Logic, which is more complicated. Um, and these are wonderful tools. They, they deal with MIDI, where you record MIDI that is then either outputted to a, a, a synth module you have or to an internal software instrument. They deal with audio, where you can record yourself singing, record yourself playing an actual guitar. And you can manipulate these things in myriad of ways. You can take the guitar you recorded, slice it up into pieces, re re-quantize um, it to have swing where it didn't have before and treat your audio almost like MIDI. Uh, they're extremely powerful tools, um, difficult to learn but very valuable um, for, making, for making demos. Um, I use Logic to make, uh, I just did a cabaret performance with Mary Testa where I make tracks uh, for us to sing over. Um, and it's just it's just a wonderful tool. Did I miss anything about it? No, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, and also the other thing is like GarageBand is actually really cheap. Yes. You know, which is great. So it's not like this like this incredibly. What well, is very sophisticated, but it's not like it, it's not something that will that will break the bank. So every young composer that has a power book and you know a little MIDI keyboard can, can what really do high quality. You know, home demos. What's wonderful about them, if you're going to do pop writing, is that there are all sorts of drum loops in there. So you can quickly throw in a drum loop mm -hmm. and, and write in the style that you want to and not have to do keyboard writing that takes the, you know, right. does the rhythm work of a drum. Um, and so it's very useful for that. I, I actually started started using a lot of the loops and it, it sort of changed my approach to writing mm -hmm. a lot. You know, there are certain projects where I you know, do uh, in a more traditional way, but like working on Rocky, for example, which is so rhythm driven, it was actually, not that we use any of these loops or at all in the final product, but just in terms of freeing my mind up and mm -hmm. you know, playing to, to a, a rhythmic groove, it was really helpful. Absolutely, because otherwise you're writing a piano part that's, that's supplying right. you with the, with the, um, <laughs> the groove and the and the energy, and if the groove is there, you can take the time to just make your harmony what it needs to be. Right. It simplifies in a great yeah. way. Yeah. Because because actually the printed scores it looks so so much simple, but but whenever you hear everything played together, it sounds quite right. rich. You know, yeah. it looks like well, there's not that that much on that page, but in <laughs> fact, it feels quite full. Right. So, yeah. Now, um, uh, Emily, we should we should hear from you about how you. What, when, when does the copies come into play? Um, at this point, I mean, I think that it's, it's, a, it's the same way it's pretty much always been, uh, which is after you guys do your, your writing and your orchestration, um, the music comes to me. And my job, it, it, essentially, the, the, the final product is that I have to provide the pieces of music that, are, that the players play every night on their stands in the pit. But along the way, I also provide, sometimes I'll provide uh, score, score mock-ups or templates for an orchestrator. Um, the work, but, but my work essentially comes at the end of the line. And we were talking beforehand, before we came into this room, about the, the, the funny thing, we're talking about all this technology and how through uh, using, well, using the technology like Dropbox and other, uh, sh other sharing programs, People can work in, they, you don't all have to be in the same room anymore with the right. upright piano, okay? 
But the bottom line is when I do my work, okay, things can get sent to me electronically. But once a show is up and running, it is just the same as it's always been. Every night during previews, I'm running to the pit with scissors and tape and a pencil. <laughs> and that is essentially the final tool the copies uses. No matter how much technology, I can use Sibelius, I can use Finale, I can get logic files, I can get MIDI files, I can get whatever it is. But in the, in the end, when you call me at 5.30 and there's a 6.30 band call and something has to happen, the bottom line is I don't just sit in my pajamas at home you know, and, and send it down via Dropbox. You know, somebody has to physically walk out of the office with a piece of paper and some scissors and get it onto those parts. So the copyist's job is a funny one because you have to keep up with the technology. You have to be able, you have to use um, we were talking earlier about Google Docs to keep track of who's doing what. You have to use Dropbox because everybody's sharing everything. You, you know, you're, you're definitely in, you, you, at least we're using two notation programs now. Uh, and, but in the end, the job is still very much the, you know, the, the, the physical. We, we still print music. Uh, we talked about the fact that I believe in a pretty short time span we'll probably be using the screens everywhere. I mean, you know, nobody wants to play a whole show off an iPad yet. Uh, some guys do because they know their parts or they've written their own drum parts and they, you know, they just put the pad there just for a reminder. But um, right now, the physical music is still on paper, you know. And I, I think that as soon as the screens get less expensive and uh, producers get more used to the fact that there's another element of technology that they have to add, pay for, you know, spend time with. I think that we'll probably be, be using um, PDFs on, on screen or I, I, I don't think we'll be using live active music files, but certainly PDFs, which will then um, obviate the need for, my to be, <laughs> for me to be there <laughs> on my hands and knees <laughs> with scissors and tape. You know? But I think that that's, that's pretty, I, so I fit in still at the end of the line and still as a marriage of technology and the old school. Mm -hmm. so. Before we, we uh, came in here today, we were actually in the little ante room across the hall and we were to, everybody at some point brought up the concept of the iPad and how that's starting to really interface with, with the, the kind of work that, that, that we do in the theater. And uh, this, uh, I guess it was a year ago. This, yeah, <laughs> uh, the still unreleased Lucky Stiff. We 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 did a, a recording session here in the uh, in, in Manhattan, and I was really impressed that Michael ran the entire session paperless. He had his iPad. He used his finger. He would change a B to a B flat. You know, if something had been you know misrepresented. He would he would make a circle. He would do all his notes that would appear on the computer screen as like a red B flat, a red circle, and then he would. Uh, Email it. I guess you. No, was oh, no, no, no. It was Dropbox, Dropbox again. Dropbox, Dropbox yeah. again. What it is? Uh, Emily was not in the room, and yet she was there. You know, like doing the changes for the parts. You know, and and it was all done with without paper. What it is? It, it, it's um, a program on the iPad called Good Reader. It's a little expensive. It's a great. Great program, a little expensive. I think it's fifteen dollars. God, we're calling it fifteen dollars expensive. How much did we spend a first copy of Finale? Well, for that Starbucks. Yes, exactly. Uh, um, and what it is is, it lets you annotate PDFs. Uh, either you know, I can circle on them. I can open up a little text field and type in a note to myself, and then I can. It can sync to any Dropbox folder. So basically, I'm not annotating the finale files, but I'm annotating a PDF I've printed of each of my scores. And for now, maybe three years, I've found that even with large orchestral scores, the largest was um, a full Philharmonic chart, um, I can pretty much work off of my screen. Now, I can't, on a large orchestra, I can't really read the notes, but I can see who's playing. And then I simply, as if you're an iPad user, you know, you pinch to zoom or whatever the opposite of a pinch is called. Um, and I can read the actual pitch. Um, this is great. Uh, it has tabs so I can have multiple files open in a theater rehearsal where the song has four parts and I can jump between them. Uh, and then I go home and because I've synced to Dropbox, I open up the PDF. There are all the changes I'm supposed to make that I marked on the PDF. And I open up my finale file and I make the changes. I send it to Emily, and it's her problem at that point. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, 
But even um, even in a simple preview, in, in, in Apple's preview program, it, it, not in, not in uh, I mean, if you don't have a full version of, of uh, Acrobat, you can, you can actually take a regular pre, uh, PDF file in preview and mark it up. There's annota there are annotation tools right in preview. So if I'm working on a PDF, not, not on an iPad, but on a computer, on a laptop, um, I can use annotation tools right in preview. And uh, again, text blocks, circles, love the arrow. Um, and, it's, and, and they're savable. So you just hit save, and suddenly you've got a document. And, yeah, and, th and those, um, those markings that you make in preview, uh, again, you, uh, you can use any text style. You command T, get your text style, you know, color, uh, size, font, everything. And it's, um, it's, really, it's, it's really great because, again, you don't have to carry that stack of yeah. immense scores. And they're always with you. Like that's and what I loved about it. Yeah. Whenever you had to run around the theater, and you know, it's like, oh, where's my score? It's always in this carryable iPad. Yeah. I would use effort to give notes to the actors. I remember one time we were in the middle of a rehearsal for Bring It On, and we had just made a change on stage, like literally within the next five minutes, and I just had to put it into finale. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a printer around, and you know, the music, uh, the pianist was already at the piano. I'm like, okay, here's a change. I ran over and put my iPad in front of him, and everyone's like, I can't believe that just happened. It was like <laughs> crazy to think that I didn't have a printer, but yet this change that had just happened, I was able to just let him see what it was yeah. instantaneously. It's, it's a miracle. It's great. It's, it's <laughs> incredible. I mean, without, that's the whole thing. I, you know, sometimes I think you can talk so much about tech, and it sort of seems like an end in of itself, but in fact, really what it is is just to keep fluidity happening and keep it, you know, quick ideas, being, being able to capture them and, and also being able to share them. But also just to, you know, and, and then I'll give you just the, the negative side from the person who's at the end of the line. Okay. You know, the negative side is, is just to speak to, to, the, to the fact that things happen so much more quickly, right. um, which is the positive side for the creative side. I mean, that, that you can make a change at, at 6.30, you know, and, and at 7 o'clock, you know, your orchestra could be playing it, whatever. But the fact is that, like, I mean, I, I, I hate to say that when I walked through the doors of this room, I just saw something on my phone, and over at Motown, they're <laughs> having a rehearsal, and, you know, and they're saying, um, could you send me? And I'm like, well, sorry, buddy, not now. But the thing is that, that I'm asked to do things that I was never asked to do before, right. and to turn right. things around in sometimes really you know, ridiculous amount of, a short amount of time, and it's doable, and that's the thing, it's, it's great, and it's the curse, because once I do it once, you know, <laughs> or once you do it once, and you say, oh yeah, you know, oh, well, she did that in an hour, she did that in half an hour, then the next night at 6.30, you get the same request, you know, so it's, and I'm, I'm exaggerating when I say 6.30, but kind of not really, you know, so, uh, so, so, there, so technology works in, in many fantastic yeah. ways, but sometimes if you are the person who's, who's at the receiving end of those requests, you know, it's very, very hard to uh, say it can't be done. Because really, there's almost, I hate to say it out loud, but there's almost no can't be done anymore. It's almost all doable. Yeah, yeah along those same lines, Emily, we have the same technology. We basically, now as a sound designer, I can sit in the house on a preview night in any seat and control every aspect of the sound system. I can change it at will. And because of that, it's also a curse because the show gets better faster and the producer says to me, wow, that's good, but if it doesn't happen the next day, right. he's like, why didn't it happen? Mm. Right, right, right. You can make right. so many fast changes, the show can get so much better, so, so much faster, that for me it's great because I also can eliminate, because years ago before this technology, I had to go through two, two or three people to get a change made, mm -hmm. and it was... It was impossible because by the time it got, to, it's like the it's like the rumor that goes around. <laughs> by the time it gets to the third person, right. your grandmother's dead. <laughs> it's like, I just wanted you to turn up the center cluster. <laughs> <laughs> but now I eliminate all of that because I'm in total control of it. Because uh, I can control every aspect of it, so I can do it live on the spot, make that change, which is I don't have to wait till tomorrow to take the note and try and put it into play and not notice the sonic change immediately. And that, that happens, I mean, we're missing the programmer here, but that happens, uh, the same thing. I mean, Randy Cohn or any programmer who's working now, you know, can sit with the iPad, also any seat in the house, and first of all, change things at, 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 as requested, but also troubleshoot. I mean, if something suddenly goes awry down there, uh, you know, and the sound isn't heard, you know, they, they can send 
information back and forth to those keyboards right you know in real time and that's that's pretty amazing I should say that really Emily's not the last in the chain the sound designer is <laughs> yes and there's this expectation at the first preview that it's uh, it's, uh. it's going to be great and for producers or directors who haven't done a musical before they they don't understand why it's not sounding perfect for a mixer who's only had two or three performances with orchestra and voices. Suddenly there's an audience in there with laughter. Suddenly the energy from the actors is completely different because yeah. there's an audience. So it, it, it's, it's kind of a rule that we know. First couple of previews, leave sound alone. Let them just. And we're very appreciative of yeah, that. <laughs> let, them, let them just, you know, don't, because you know. Every um, note you have. Is killing me. Yeah, I already yeah. know. I already know it. I'm yeah. sitting like there. You've already heard. Yeah. You've already I'm heard. sitting there going. Right. But oh I God. also, but regarding the, the, this real time concept, I mean, when you when you are, or actually, I say you or the sound operator is doing the show, that operator is doing the show. The same way an actor is doing the show. They've got their show. They've got their timing. They've got their moves. And I have been this very season been in the theater where you know we're a composer. Uh, somebody new to the game, you know, whatever, will run up the aisle in the middle of the first, second, third preview and run to the soundboard and start to give notes during the show to a sound operator. And, you know, and you have to know that that, that person understands that it's possible for that operator to change something in, in that moment, but that it's completely wrong to do so. You get that, that you, everybody has to be educated to know what you know? What is not not only that you can do something because it's possible, but that sometimes you really shouldn't do something at that moment. That you need to wait and because that that sound operator is literally has he has every person on one fader, and if one person is talking, that person comes up. If another person talks right after, that person comes up. Never unless it's a group number. So he's doing thousands of moves during the show, and it's finger management. It's also these puppies. Mm -hmm. And that's why the sound operator is our most important person in the building to us, mm -hmm. because there has to be implicit trust between us, and they're, they're a performer. I mean, that, it's, that's, that's if a good. sound operator is good, our that. shows can sound great. If a sound operator is bad, even if we design the best show in the world, it's not going to sound good. I mean, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. We're in their hands. And the reason why they're so invaluable is I leave the building after the opening, they can do thousands of performances, and all of them are exactly the same. And that takes incredible talent to do. And what's really hard is that a lot of people don't realize that not everything uh, is necessarily the sound person's uh, fault. That is to say, like say you're watching a show and all of a sudden the guitar is blazingly loud. It's not necessarily the sound operator's fault. It could be that that particular guitarist hit his pedal at the wrong moment and made his guitar blazingly loud. And if you go to the sound guy, turn him down, turn him down, he winds up chasing him because he turned the guitar way down, and when it was really an accident on the guitar player's fault, so then for the rest of the show, that guitar player's Go really on. down, Go not on. where it yeah. needed to be. And the same thing, vice so versa. Yeah. yeah. Or sometimes maybe the keyboard player is actually on the wrong patch. He's supposed to be playing a, uh, a piano sound, and instead he happens to be on a big, loud boom. <laughs> People will think, it's the sound guy. What did you do? What happened? And it's really just a mistake that the keyboard player made that won't happen the next day, probably. And they know it happened, and maybe people around them might not know. So it's it's interesting that people kind of need to know or just have to expect that the sound guy really knows, you know. Yeah, what it's they interesting are. to say that because his job is totally like the actors, like the orchestra, totally performance based. Yep. It changes every single night, and he has to figure out what that changes. Yep. The, the other thing I find for all our discussion of technology here is that the goal is not perfection. That perfection is really nothing to do with the theater. There isn't a perfect mix. There isn't a perfect orchestration. There isn't that. It, it, there's always a compromise because there's so many elements coming at an audience member. There are lyrics. There's orchestration. There's music. There's lights. There, the music's going through sound. It's to achieve a, a result, and sometimes I have to let some of my orchestration be a little buried so that the song can come through in a way that it won't be on an album because an audience is hearing something for the first time in a space that's so not acoustically perfect. Our theaters are not built to be great acoustic spaces. They're built to look beautiful old-fashioned palaces. They, a lot of them, am I right, don't? You're totally right. Do <laughs> not, are not good sounding buildings. Um, and so the achievement is the best possible result. It is not for perfection. Some people look for perfection, and that's 
Well, and that's the I important part of what we all do. It's totally collaborative and with communication. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I, ha I have a question about about this. If you're talking about the buildings, the theater, the, and, and acoustics and whatnot, uh, I don't know which uh, this season. Which, show, which shows you're working on entirely. But I know that in a few of the shows that I've been working on now, musicians are no longer in the pit, but they are in rooms built below the stage or separated into, uh, uh, most of the orchestra might be in the pit, some might be on the seventh floor. Right now I'm working on a show where everybody's in the pit and the drummer is on the seventh floor. I mean, that's happened many times. Um, or rooms are built uh, with, with isolation, you know, the, the brass is here and the drums are here. And, and it's much more studio-like. Um, can you talk about how yes, that uh, works? Yes, and case in point is the revival of Ragtime. We had 11 live musicians in the pit, uh, strings and a harp, and 17 people in a room downstairs mm -hmm. with a keyboard player in another room. Okay. Um, and the goal right. of that is to, and I was told this by musicians, is to make you believe all 28 people come are in the pit. And the, and, funny, well, the, the, the funny thing about, 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 that, about that is uh, we were in the Neil Simon Theater, and that's where Porgy and Bass premiered. You know, and I looked up how many pieces were were playing on the opening night of Porgy and Bass, and there were 40 pieces. And I so went to our producer. I said, "Well, we have 28, which was you know like, like sumptuous for 2009." And I said, "Well." Where did they put, you know, the additional uh, twelve players? And it turns out that the, when the seat, uh, when the theater was refurbished, they added more rows. Yes. So all the, you know, yes. yes. the rows. Like much larger. There was pit. a larger pit, but also um, another thing that, that that I noticed, and I notice these things because I crawl around the pit a lot, all the pits, um, <laughs> is that, that the, the pits have, have also gotten smaller because with technology, there a lot of times. Uh, the designers will say, "Well, you know, we'll, we're going to do this thing," and they, they, you know, need to put a lift right in the middle <laughs> of where the pit is, or they'll, do, you know, lots of st elevators and yeah. or, or trapdoor things that things that shouldn't <laughs> ever have been in the pit. Suddenly, now we have a stagecraft that requires technology to be right where the musicians used to be. So even if you had 40 people in that in that theater uh, in that pit. Um, you know, now depending on your set build, you might only be able to fit twelve. I mean, so right. so every you know, it, but that also is a tech. You know, this this well, has to do with technology. It's turned into a, now a sound designer's job to actually tell everybody how many people can fit in the pit, yeah, because we we pit. literally well we compute a generated that because over the years we've developed symbols for how wide a cello player needs to be and a violin player and a trumpet player and a drum kit and we literally lay it out around the posts that people don't think are going to be trouble <laughs> where the first violin is hitting the post every five seconds <laughs> um, and it allows the conversation to continue where it becomes real to say look we have a problem yeah. and or we need to take three dressing rooms you know, or uh, or as in the case of one show, you know, a, a broom closet where we put the heart. You know, I mean, literally. So the, the other season I did worked on Leap of Faith, where the orchestra was divided into th four groups. Two of them in each of the boxes were the rhythm section. Winds and strings were in the pit, but facing away from the conductor because the pit was covered, and he was in a little, little hole where he could see the cast, and the brass were down in the basement. And so nobody was in the same place. And at a point where it, it got so ridiculous that I thought, why can't they all be in another room somewhere so they're playing together as a group? As a group. Because if the pits are going to be so abused with technology and, in, and being covered and stuff, at least the musicians can play together as a group. However, on one of the shows that's running right now where the musicians are all playing together in another room, they say it sounds very weird because the rhythm section's completely, you know, all the guitars and keyboards are completely direct. So if you're walking in the room without headphones on, you don't hear them. The drums are pads, so it sounds like some guy hitting the table. And they say they're playing together, but they feel like they're not really part of a show the way they are when they're in a pit. They're in a room getting together, playing music under headphones. And the show, and sometimes like it's a show that starts with dialogue, and they said sometimes they don't, if their headphones aren't on, they don't realize the show has even started. <laughs> Wow. So but we, we had talked about this a long time ago as this sort of you know a, a dystopia of, of you know where, where you know, we thought well and this was before technology 
allowed for um, uh, orchestras to be split into four places in the theater. Right. Oh, a, a dystopian vision of a building in some cheap part of town when there still was a cheap part of town, <laughs> where there were just, you know, uh, if there are 20 theaters, so there were 20 big rooms, and there were 20 orchestras, and it had five of eight every night, they'd file in, and you'd have your, you know, all your different shows, and they'd all be streamed into the you know, sound system in the theater, and whatever. And really and truly, we're not that far away from that being It's how they're doing, uh, it's, away. it's how they did the uh, Academy Awards. Well, I know. Right. I yeah. well, no, and I work, I work on the Tonys, and we, we had, you know, I mean, when, I hate to say it, but the Tonys, a celebration of live theater, and you have live theater awards, and we were at the Beacon Theater, and I and the band were at a studio on 26th Street, everything going through the truck, and not one live musician in the house, not one. So, you know, we're in a place where that's possible. But we don't, nobody, want, we don't but want the yeah. world out there to know, but oh, most, no. most the tracks are pre-recorded for the musical numbers on the Tonys <laughs> anyway, but, so you know, but we're not going to let you know. But besides that, <laughs> but besides that, the fact that yeah. the, few, the few cues that we play live, yeah. no, the, the music that we do play live is only live in that it's being played by live musicians, but they're 40 blocks away under headphones. So and, it's a and, very strange world. And, that and we completely hate that. Does that cause I mean, any kind of delay problem? It causes, it causes a huge amount of problems for us because we have to, every, we have to allow these rooms to cross-reference each other, right. which adds an enormous right. amount of equipment. Right. Um, and we have to give them a sense that they're actually playing the show, right. so it adds huge video monitors. Right. Um, but the biggest thing it does is it takes the actual sonic element out of the room. Right. Which we can't regenerate. I mean, we can't make a trumpet sound like he's pulled. Well, we try and fake it, but right. if we have a, a we have we have a better chance if the orchestra's all in one room. Right. But if they're split, I mean, especially if you have, and we we fight this all the time when producers say to us, "Well, we'll put the rhythm section over here in boxes, and we'll put the other orchestra someplace else." And we're like, "We we can't win, because no. no. acoustically that trumpet is going to make a sound." And it's gonna it's gonna fight everything else because you're gonna reference those boxes where the other orchestras is gonna be round like this, like we want them to seem to be, right. um, and it's it's really difficult for us to, to get around. So we as much as we can we fight it. Right. We win sometimes and we lose sometimes. Next time you should invite a set designer so we have someone to abuse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for all, for all for all the covered yeah, pits yeah. we have to yes, deal with. Yes. <laughs> Well, well the, the other thing, talking about you know playing in different parts and trying to find some way for people that are literally physically dislocated to, to play together as a group, you know, it, that's sort of a natural segue into the concept of click track. You know, there's a really interesting article that was in Sunday Times that some of you may have seen about uh, Hands on a Hard Body, which is a new musical that's opening like now, right? Right. 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 They're yeah. 25 minutes in. Yeah. yeah. And, and the co-composer is a Trey Anastasio, who's from the uh, the, the the rock uh, pop group Fish, and. Uh, in, in the article, it, it was an interview, and he said that he was listening to a performance, and he thought there's, there's something not right about it. And it turned out that all the players were playing to clip track, and he, he felt that there was a natural give and take, ebb and flow, and, and for that to come from like somebody from the pop world, the rock, <coughs> rock and roll world, to say, get rid of the clip track, and that seemed like almost, you know, yeah. uh, it was a really surprising comment for me to, to read, you know, because a lot of shows that are less pop oriented, you know, a lot of them use click, especially whenever you're using either, you know, loops or pre-recorded elements and, you know, mixing it, all that together. It's been a little bit of trial and error for me. Uh, I know a lot of people have a love-hate relationship with the click. It, it, for me, it depends on what kind of music it is. Yeah. And I found for Bring It On, we benefited from having the click happen because when you're doing a hip-hop song, hip-hop is based around regularity that does not change. And if that song starts at 96 BPM, it's going to end at 96 BPM. And whenever there's any kind of fluctuation, you hear it. Yeah. So I know for certain groove players, some people prefer that because if the guitarist knows that he can just hear that metronome and rock against that, even if maybe the drum player might bend a little bit, everyone has a frame of reference to go to. I right. remember we were rehearsing once, uh, I, I think I might have been bringing it on, and when we were in the band rehearsal, the entire band was on click, but those of us behind the table were not, so we couldn't hear what they were hearing. And I think the conductor gave like a, a cue that might not have been clear. I, something happened and people didn't know where it was, 
and for two seconds it sounded like and then by B3 everyone was just and then all of a sudden right. like it congealed and then we were back on track. It was really interesting to hear everyone kind of gravitate towards that. Um, but uh, the other thing that I learned is that when I build click tracks, and I do it for tempo mostly, I've learned that if there is a spot where the band has like a whole note, I will build a natural retard into the click so that it feels like it's breathing. For example, if we're doing a Bacente Fe, and there's a spot where the, the band is grooving, the dun, 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 the days into weeks, the weeks into years, and here have I stayed. I found that if I kept the click going at the same tempo, yeah. that actor would always naturally slow down because they would feel the band stop and they thought they had more time. <coughs> and would, without a doubt, the band would always get to the next downbeat before she was, and it always felt like a little bit of a skip. So then I learned to start anticipating that any time there's like a hold or any time there's a hold note, I will, if I've been at 96 BPM for that one bar, I will take it down two clicks just wow. for that duration. And then as soon as we get back to the tempo, just go back in. When you hear it in the theater, you cannot tell the difference. And just for whatever reason, it can anticipate that all of a sudden the actor will feel that space and they'll hear that and they'll want to react to that. Oh, so I try to build, I try to anticipate that so that it feels natural because it's human. And human, human, and human is supposed to. which is crazy because you try to use computer to emulate something that should be human to begin with. But again, you know, I, I do it most because I can feel it. I can tell when it's not locked in and I can just feel when it doesn't groove the same way. And I, again, I only only talk about certain types of music. Like I would not uh, recommend it for Annie, for example, but for Bring It On, without a doubt. Did you ever have problems along the way with things getting off from the click because an actor jumped the measure? Or you know, it's funny. I actually never had that happen. Uh, for whatever reason, and I just need to just knock on wood, uh, any errors that we ever had with click tracks were like 99% operator error. Right. There's only one every time where we ever had something like go awry. And you always worry about that. Like you think, oh my god, if the actor jumps ahead, what's going to happen? But I found that that was very rarely the case. And uh, you know, people would always just kind of find their way. You know? Would you do one start per song, or would you do a, a couple of different starts? It depends. It depends what the song is. You know, 96,000 for In the Heights like, was really super long clicks. And there were certain points where something stopped, and we were able to kind of cash back on if we needed right. to. But by and large, again, it just kind of seemed to work out that for whatever reason, people would just know where they are, and it would just work out. Were those kinds of choices, were they developed, I guess, trial and error over time? Or? For me, yes, yeah. because just like you were saying, and again, the, the article, uh, there were times when I found the click got in the way. Mm. And no matter what tempo you would put it at, it just wouldn't quite feel right. So there are times when it just does need to feel human, but I feel like that you do need to rely on having a good rhythm section, a good conductor, yeah. a good person to call it right at the right tempo. You know, there are times that I love the click track because as an MD, I'll know that every time I go see the show, that song will be at the correct tempo. And you know, the actors might be like, yeah, that song felt slow today. I'm like, well, it was the same tempo it was yesterday. You know, it's like, right. it's something else that they're reacting to, and then you try to figure out how to make them, you know, how to get it back to whatever the energy was. But uh, I find it actually makes things relaxed, because I know that, like, tempo won't be an issue. I think one of the larger things we've been talking about today is how important with all these different technologies and with the velocity of changes and decisions being made, to try to find the way to keep the communication open for the group, you know, because I mean, it's in your case, you know, you're, you're playing like in the Heights. But I remember seeing it uh, for the first time when it was off Broadway before it had moved uptown. And my first impression, I told you this, was whenever I heard uh, um, Alex was in the pit playing, and he was the music director and the co-orchestrator. And I just remember his playing was phenomenal. And Thank I just you. kept thinking, who the hell are they go going to get to sub that show? <laughs> because it was just brilliant playing. But, but the idea of having you know, one person for that particular show wearing at least three hats. So you, you know, trying to trying to keep all the information clear about click and what a performer's need is and how the conductor communicates with that and also, you know, gets the click and, you know, the, the tech to all work together. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. I, I mean, you know, I, I, for me, I guess I just had such a very, you know, strong opinion about what it should sound like and I had worked from that show so early on that you know I, I knew what it was that I was looking for and I felt that that was the only way I was going to be able to get what was in here out yeah. there. Yeah. Well I, also even before that you know you you'd worked on Wicked which I think is a really interesting or orchestration because it's sort of a symphonic uh, orchestration that has this really tight pop sound at the heart of it and and I know that you, you did a lot of work on the you know, on the on the pop part of that, and is that a show that, that relied a, a lot on click trying to keep? No, not at all. There's actually two all. spots that click at all, and they're like 32 bars a piece, yeah. and that's it. Yeah, the rest of the show is just completely off the field. Very, <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Very often a click will be used because 
um, pre-recorded vocals are being added. Exactly. Um, for instance, very often in a tap dance, uh, I remember working on the Christmas Carol that played at um, Madison Square Garden, and there was a big tap dance, Abundance and Charity, where all the girls, and they wanted them all singing loud, and the singing came out like this. And so what you do is you, you pre-record and you have that click where the band just you know learns to have, be wearing headphones and go to click right at that point, or at least the rhythm section is wearing. So that's where click has been used up until Alex's work, mm -hmm. mostly just for that. Right, for like the dance breaks. And yeah, keep it where, you're, where you're adding vocals then. Is it yeah. too dangerous to, to ask a question about ask record? It. I mean, pre we're talking about pre-recorded yeah, things sure. and pre-recorded vocals and for a reason, for, you know, a dance number or whatever. And then we have this whole thing about, um, you know, hip-hop or, or real pop music coming into the theater. Um, so needing, needing things that, 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 needing types of sounds that, that are not created by live uh, acoustic instruments. But then you, you know, where do you, where does that line get, get crossed now to uh, having other things on the tracks that might be pre-recorded or enhancements or whatever? And there's been, there have been so many strictures against that. I mean, in our, in our union rules and in the sort of the propriety of what goes in the theater and all that. And where, where do we live now? Where do we live now in, 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 in reference to uh, adding in, things in, on track? In my recollection, it's probably been like three times in 20 years that equities approved it. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. Do you mean so equities approved what? Like vocals like that? Yeah. Well, I'm talking about, but also but, 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 vocals. But, but, but you're talking about adding or... instrumental tracks or drum tracks. My feeling is um, technology is a tool. Mm -hmm. It can be used and it can be abused. Um, a tool that came in in the late 80s was the use of synthesis and sampling. It's still being abused somewhat where people will you know, um, use string samples to just play string lines. Uh, that's not an abuse. That's that's an artistic choice some people make. Um, and I think the same thing's going to happen with tracks of instruments. There's times where it'll be used in an artistically wonderful way, and sometimes it'll be used just to save money. People are going to do it. I, you can't stop technology, but you can. The thing about the theater is the more mechanized, the less we're actually in that room, the less it is theater, and the less it's appealing as live performance. So I don't think live musicians are going to disappear, but we're in a world where people will always abuse it somewhat, and we're going to have to encourage them to say, no, let's do it live. It's, it's more fun. Do you know, um, in Annie, I have one violin, one cello, and I chose never to use a string sample in it because I just felt like, well, all right, maybe I used it in the bows a little because it just <laughs> needs to be big and loud. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but, but there's a point where it's like, I just don't want to go there. And, 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 but some, you know, this is, this is a battle we're going to have to fight one way or another. I, you know, whether it's a union battle or whether it's an artistic battle. So I do think tracks are going to appear. I think somebody along the way is going to abuse it. Sure. And I think someone else, like Alex, is going to use it in a wonderfully artistic means that just enriches what we can do in musical theater. Like when we did in Bring It On, there was nothing ever on the tracks that we had that was supposed to take a place of a live person playing. Like if you had heard the tracks for Bring It On, like for example, Legendary was a great example, which is a big, huge cheer number that had tons and tons of cheer effects, tons of arpeggiators and stuff. Like if you had heard the click track, it would have sounded like this. Like this, it would be like a metronome. <laughs> like all this crazy stuff that literally that's what it would sound like. You can't do that. Uh, um, you know, the arpeggio stuff can't be on a keyboard. Maybe someone could hit the samples, but it wouldn't have like the right effect. Like you'd have to worry about what the levels were. It's something that was predictable. But never once did I want to have the sound of like a sax player, you know, playing a, 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 the sound of like a, a violin trying to do a run. It was always the intention to do it for things that were expressly computerized, synthesized, digital sounding things. And to your thing about vocals, you know, you are very right. Equity is, is um, really strict about what you're allowed to do. And you can never, you know, they never allow you to like have pre-recorded vocals just because like people are really tired from the dance and they can't keep up. It's always because they can't make a costume change. And again, in our case in Bring It On, we had pre-recorded vocals because 
people were flying up in the air. 10 or 15 oh, feet in the air. Yeah, oh, we had like air. four guys on the floor supporting like two girls, and they tried to sing it with something like this. <laughs> you know, and Equity actually acknowledged that, and they allowed us to use the pre-recorded vocals because it was for the safety of the actors, because it was literally physically impossible to sing. When it's that kind of case, they were able to understand what the case is for it, and you have to go through a very laborious process and show exactly which bars are going to be pre-recorded and why, and give them sheet music and like mm -hmm. annotated this. And well, I mean, it's the same thing with Local 802. Sure. You know, they they yeah. police. Right. I mean, it's, it's you know, I mean, police the, the those kinds of effects. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Michael, you're right. It, people are going to use it artistically, and people are going to be abuse it. I mean, I did a show in Las Vegas where we had eight players on a bandstand, and before we opened, we cut two players because of finances. In two months, we cut the entire band, totally pre-recorded right. because of wow. finances. Yeah. I remember, I remember seeing uh, Come Fly With Me, Twyla Tharp's, you know, uh, tribute to, to Frank Sinatra, and they featured this great looking band, you know, right on, on the stage, but then all of a sudden you're hearing this enormous string section come in, and, and you're thinking, where are those violin players? They're, not, they're nowhere. You know, so obviously that was a pre-record of, of, of yeah. music, you know. I worked on that show. Oh, you there did? There was a lot of discussion. Where, so where were those, those fiddle players? And it was a recording, <laughs> not a sample? In other words, it wasn't a keyboard playing it; it was a recording. They were record. They were they were using some of the the Frank Sinatra oh, right. tracks. And they sort of deconstructed them and got it. Right. Good, good. Questions? Oh, okay, great. I think I think we're at the question part <laughs> part part of part of the, the evening. Yeah, yeah. So, um, should we should we delve into questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, kind of thinking backwards from all of this, as as uh, acoustic instruments start to integrate more with sounds that can't be made by an acoustic instrument, the arpeggiators, and even in regard to like pre-recorded things, what specific challenges does that present from a notational standpoint? Anything mm -hmm. you, you mm -hmm. need? Well, I'm just notating a new chroma loom for Sunday in the Park for a production happening mm -hmm. in Paris, and it's all based on things where I'm just notating the trigger note. Um, if no one is playing along with it, there's no reason to notate it. But if it's, by the way, you're going to get a score to the chromolum soon. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, you know, it, it is, but I, I've done things where tracks had to be written out because people are playing along with them. And so you have to do some kind of notation of what's happening electronically um, um, to represent. I mean, it. you guys both use technique, you know, techniques where, where if it's just if it's just something triggering, you know, c chords or harmonies. I mean, we'll just you know, you'll put the note that the person has to perform, and then we'll have a series of small notes or parenthetical notes or or a, a little you know like an osea bar somewhere on the page where where we notate. What, what's being heard because if it's something that's integral to a score and there's somebody who's looking at that score, uh, they can't just see you know a whole note there and then, and then all of a sudden they're hearing you know something <laughs> happening. So yeah, I mean, but there you you've done notation. I, Larry Hockman often writes you know yeah. we'll write these you know we'll write the trigger note and then some version of except not that 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 goes when it's when it's something that is um, sort of traditionally musical and not. Not uh, effects. Effects. Yeah, yeah. You can't. You don't notate. Yeah. Like, I wound up right. not notating a lot of the ring it on like effects, like the explosions and things. But the, you know, if I had to write down a piano part that was based on that arpeggio of the sound, then I would try to find some way to notate it. And for example, like the same song I described, it was really hard to get pianists to play. So I would just find a way to kind of simplify that and make it playable and, and still groove. So yeah, it, it does pose some challenges for sure. Because I think we all get a lot of you know emails from uh, you know other productions you know, uh, and, and you know like at the mapping you know that concept oh, of mapping. Oh, that's a big question. That's a big question. But that's again we're missing the programmer person at this table. But yeah, but, but, but yeah, that's something. I mean, we started as far back as Once on This Island, yeah. which was that we had, especially with small bands that are four or five pieces, the ability to play one note and a chord would come out, and you could program whatever voicing you wanted for that chord, and this allowed the right hand. So you were playing like a two-hand pad part and allowed the right hand free to do, you know, a, a trebly bell, you know, electric piano fill um, or string sample, whatever. Um, 
called and, something other than string sense. Right, exactly. <laughs> and but the trigger notes would sometimes even get as strange as not even being chordal tones because you were doing a whole series of chords and you'd use up the notes that were actually in the chord. So you'd have to use in the key of A, you'd have to use an F natural to get this particular D chord <laughs> because you had used up all the F sharps, Ds, and As. And so you would rent this part out, and and people would be renting it and looking uh, at your synth part and going, why is there an F natural here? And and you had to explain all that. What I started doing was putting in little parentheses a half note later in a second layer in finale, removing the stem and putting the notes that actually came out of it. So it was a self-explanatory thing of that F natural is actually this, this right. D major triad with an E added in this voicing. But also you your problem at how to deal with it <laughs> at your high school, but this is what right, it's supposed to be. Like. But yeah. the thing is but that also is about you know whether when, when shows go into rental do the, does that rental company license the programming as well? And, that, and that's if it's your show, you know, you need to you need to find out, you know, what's going to happen with that because again, then they'll yeah. send out these parts and uh, half your, you know, half your thing will be missing. I mean, if you don't, yeah. you know, if it doesn't go, the programming doesn't go with it. And so, but there are deals to be made, and that's a business thing. You know, it's artistic slash business. And, and I have to say, the, the performance of that original orchestration of Once in this Island is handicapped because it was two keyboards very early in the synth era, and the programming's up in the air. The instruments it was done for haven't existed for 20 years. Proteuses, you know, Yamaha TX-802s, uh, Roland D-550s, all long, long gone. So even if I could translate the patch data from the program that no longer exists on the floppy disks to throw <laughs> there, there'd be no way to do it. So, I mean, we could create new programming, but it, it, it really hampers when people rent that orchestration of Stephen's show. I, I have to say, uh, I still... <laughs> My keyboard controller at home is a Proteus. <laughs> and I kept thinking, it's worked for me all these years, like, don't change it. <laughs> this horrible little Casio like. And I also think that when you rent Once on this Island, you get my handwritten. I think you still get well, my handwritten. That's, the other, that's the other thing. I mean, my favorite score that, that we did, and uh, it's, we did My Favorite Year. You know, Michael did this beautiful orchestration for, for My Favorite Year. And when you look at the rental score, this is before you know, the advent of computer. You know notation, and it's written in three hands, and it's Emily's hand, it's my hand, and Ted Sperling, who is our music director, it's his hand, and, and that, part of that was you know the history of that. Yeah, I mean this this you know, week I got a I got an iPhone picture you know from somebody who was playing songs for New World, and you know and, and said oh look and there it is, and it's like my you know my my little scrawl from you know from and the, you know that's the one thing to talk about you know the change in, in technology and and that that you know not to get too nostalgic, but that's a very there's something very much lost in, in, in you know what comes off the printer now um, that you don't get that human quality of, of the notation and and actually feeling that somebody actually wrote that thing you know yeah. we, and we see it and now urgency. and you know that you know that it was created yeah. by a group of people but it yeah, really has absolutely. a sense of created by as opposed to written by I mean really written by as someone who got a C plus in penmanship through all of <laughs> elementary school, <coughs> learning to write a neat score was a real struggle for me and slowed me down for many years. Finale was huge turnaround for me in terms of picking up the speed at which I could orchestrate. But it was something I loved to do. Uh, you know, the, it felt like I was crafting a chair, yeah, that, like a carpenter, making this score and getting, mm -hmm. and and looking at a page and seeing the density of the of the graphite on it, and somehow that meaning something in terms of orchestral weight. Mm -hmm. You know, the picture. One of the reasons when I prepare my scores. I don't let the whole rest appear in empty bars because it gets in the way of my seeing what's, getting a general picture of what's there and what's not there. Because I would never fill them in in the, in the old handwritten scores either. I remember just playing through March of the Falsettos. Which is, in my, which is in my hand, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, yeah. Oh, and you have to tell, we have to give a little nod to your wife, Hannah. 
uh -huh. because Hannah. Uh, oh yes, it, it was great. She she would she would put in all the vocal lines with all the, all the notations and the rhythms. Yes, and the lyrics beautifully done, and then would hand them over to Michael, who would do the orchestration. I said, it is amazing that you were so smart to marry a woman who would, can read music. And she says, I can't read music entirely Literally. visually. <laughs> she, would, yeah. like, she would copy the notes in just. <laughs> just by, by, by how they look and do the lyrics and she would get around. And, and that was the big change when notation software came along and I could just paste the piano vocal from the composer in Well, if you have a composer is. like Steve Flaherty who Notates. writes the most complete, fantastic you know, piano vocals, yes. I mean, not well, everybody it's, does It's that. fun. I mean, you, know, you always say, like, that's your project. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do we have some more com uh, questions? Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, first of all, thank you all. This has been so yeah. enlightening <laughs> and uh, inspiring. And I have given notes. Uh, about sound during performances, and I thought, guys. But uh, Alex and Michael, you, you mentioned uh, you don't like to get large demos with too many ideas spelled out. What would be the ideal uh, that you would get from a composer? Would be simply. Uh, What's the style? Can you just give us a quick idea? Well, I would say not pop necessarily, mm. but, but something other than pop. That, I'd require. And, and also, uh, you say you use logic. Is uh, is that the desired, uh, is that the kind of the realm in, in theater on Broadway? Well, you know, I would say if it's not pop, like I'm happy just hearing a piano part. And yeah, yeah. like that's yeah, all I would that, need. That would be it. it yeah, yeah, if it were pop, it would be helpful for me to know at least where you heard the drums playing. And okay. maybe just drums and piano might be enough, and, and the vocals, and that would be it. Uh, that, that's my take on it. I agree. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's we want to hear what your songwriting gestures are. Yeah. You know, then we sit down with you after and say, how many pieces we're told the band is. It's never how many we want the band to be. It's how many we're told the band is going to be and what they should be. You hear strings, okay, because it's a romantic score. Let's go strings. There's a jazz bend to it. Okay, let's let's go with a couple of saxes and and and, and acoustic bass. You know, the instrumentation should be something that comes after the playwriting's done because it's a result of the playwriting. And to uh, answer your, your logic question, I mean, again, it's just whatever people's comfort level is. I mean, you know, if it's just a piano part and vocals, you could literally put your iPhone on top of the piano and just let it roll, and that's fine too. I I was a performer user for many years, and in some ways digital performer is easier to, because it's built more like a tape recorder, mm -hmm. and it's easier to use. However, Logic is wonderful with, it has a wonderful library of loops, has, it's just wonderful with making sound, um, and it's become much more standard than performer at this point. I, in terms of the theater, I don't think there's anything standard. Logic and performer are more overall tools for the music industry. Um, even Pro Tools now, uh, uh, Doug Besterman uses uh, the MIDI section of Pro Tools as his sequencer. He feels it's gotten powerful enough that he doesn't need a dedicated s sequencer. Uh, it's whatever you're comfortable and whatever works for you as a tool to, to do things in. And I know people are starting to get hip to Ableton Live. That's another kind of up and coming. People are using that one. Yeah, I know that's on Kinky Boots as well. That's kind of like the next wave of like, you know, it, it, a lot of people who are doing the electronic dance music are starting to do that, so that's making its way to the theater. I, I need to learn it so I can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But um, and by the way, it, what I said about the iPhone, that's you know, if it's going to an orchestrator, if it's going to producers and other people, that's a separate <laughs> other thing. Right, obviously. but that's the thing about the demo is that it has to serve two purposes. You know, yeah. that you have the demo that you want to use to sell your show, which you know yeah. also. Michael said at the very beginning, you don't want it to be the 65-piece prog yeah. orchestra. But but, um, but then you have the one that, that you might give to your creative collaborators, and those might be different. Right. I mean, yes? I'm wondering, how, how do you all manage when you're uh, playing uh, jazz kinds of stuff, and you try to get the machine to print for you? I tried it. I went crazy. It was dotting and flagging all over the place because I kept kicking all the beats. Oh, so you're trying to play in, in tempo? Yeah, my son tried to make me do that. I finally ended up I can't play in tempo. No, but 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 they don't notate well in tempo. When the, when when finale exactly. for I I had finale one before they named it after years, mm -hmm. very early, and they when they first came out with it, everyone every, all the composers were going great. I'm just going to play in my piano vocal and that's it. And it's never 
ever work because it, it but still doesn't work. it still it's doesn't work. work and yeah. you, you what you have to do like any jazz notation you have to just enter it in in, in quick quick note well, that's entry. That's why I'm still writing everything by hand because it's driving me nuts. Sure. Well, but, and but, you say swing eighths and it's done. Right, but you can still use it. You can still enter notes in speedy note entry. Learn to use that speedy note entry, which is where you basically, you play the C chord and you hit a, a, a key on the keypad to say this is an eighth note. You hit your next thing, hit it, hit it again without playing the note and that's a rest. Oh, and see. so you're entering one note at a time. You're, I mean, that's how we use finale. I mean, anybody who's using finale or Sibelius enters, enters the music one line, one note exactly, exactly, at a time. Exactly. And, yeah. and you build your, if you have a piano part, you're building it as if you were notating it with a pen, but you're using the computer to Well, I was using something called Muse Score. Yeah. On my, and my kid comes in, who is such a computer, you know, and he says, what in the hell are you doing? What's, I, I can't stand this. I can't play it. Because if I play it, all these flags and baloney come up, and I'm, I'm finished. Yeah, no. No, that's. Do you, you enter it, and then uh, if you're a jazz musician, you know it's just you write even eighths, and then you just write swing eighths at the top. And which is a note to all composers don't notate don't swing for us, swing. please. Yeah. 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 Musicians yeah. hate it. No 12 8, none of that. None of that. Yeah. 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 But, but we should say that, uh, that, that that way of entering the music, it's, I, I think most composers, or a lot of composers do, that's the way I enter all my scores. But, and you can learn it like from Finale, you know, through the little tutorials. But the thing you need to know is that whenever I was first learning how to do it in '94, um, I think the, I think the first lesson was uh, Alouetta, you know, which is a very simple French tune that we all know. And I could have written it by pencil, and it would have taken me 20 seconds. And, yeah. and I said to Emily, I said, I'm so proud I got Alouetta written in the computer. And, and I said, the only downside is it took me three hours. <laughs> As I kind of speed up. Eventually, it does not, I did not take oh, Yeah. So give yourself a long weekend for your oh, first yeah. Give yourself a couple French of them. Yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> For all your proposals and orchestrators, when you initially get your ideas down, do you go right to um, finale, or do you still use pencil on paper? Because I used to, I still need my pencil on paper to, to sketch it out. If I'm, if I'm in rehearsal, you know, and there's a transition that needs to happen, like I still will have a sheet of staff paper and just sit on the piano, put the pencil in my mouth, play some chords, and write it and change it. There, there's something I still yeah. love about the tactile feeling of it. Mm -hmm. And then I hand it to the intern yeah. who will enter it. I haven't picked up a pencil to write music in since 2004. Really? So, how big is yeah. screen? I have two screens. I have um, on the computer. I, they're both just 20 inch screens and I keep one uh, in, in landscape and one in, uh, what's the other word? Portrait. 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 Thank you. Because for tall scores, uh, and and my my desk is just a full eighty eight key keyboard with a little drawer for my mouse and stuff, and I ba and I used to at the very beginning I still sketched on top of a piano vocal receiver. Now I paste the first thing I do is I paste the p composer's piano part into the piano part. I paste in the vo insert, not paste, insert the vocal line and the piano part, and then I do my sketching right on it. It, it it's sort of like. I don't. I'm not in rehearsal like Alex, who works also as a music supervisor, and so he's there, not in a situation where he has a setup. I'm at home always, and so the the setup is there, um, and so I've just. I want to cut out all the middlemen, you know, all the middle stages, and I just will sketch right there, pull stuff out of the piano part, do things like notate the three trumpet part, or the five, the three clarinet parts, put all the articulations in the dynamics, and then explode them onto the three staffs. So I'm not writing it three times. Right, and and then I'm you know very often I'll rewrite, I'll rewrite the piano part because it needs to be a little different for what I'm orchestrating. Uh, yeah. I think the important thing to keep in mind though is you know do whatever feels most comfortable and and is the most fluid for you. You know everybody's different. Yeah. You know I, I find that I get ideas and they, they come in quickly and they come in fleetingly and they come in in strange places like they could be in an elevator or a cross town bus 
<laughs> so I always, I always encourage people to carry a little pad that they can notate something down or even sing it into your, your, your phone, your iPhone. You know, whatever it takes to, to capture the idea because they're, they're fleeting. Mm -hmm. you know, and then you have your, the basic idea caught and then you can you know, run home to your piano or you know, right. do, do it with, with what you need to do. I always look at a difficult passage before going to sleep. Because it looks so much easier in the morning. Yeah, because that's that's an interesting thing. Like, like before you go to bed, do you do you do, do you like review your day's work, or do you say I'll this set, is what I need to know? Or? I'll definitely set if I've just finished a score. I'll yeah. definitely set up the next one mm -hmm. and look at it and think, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got to do it, oh yeah, oh yeah. And and by the next morning, it just it doesn't look so bad, you know. And by bad, I mean difficult, you know. Like, how am I going to do this with what few I have? And and the solution and the solution suggests itself. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Sound designer and composers with the effects, like the things that you were describing. Um, do you ever? Does the sound designer ever create a sound for you? Sure. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. All the time. Yeah. I mean, we have a huge crossover in terms of. I mean, we're responsible. If it makes a noise, in the end, it's our responsibility. And and in the world of non-musical players, there are quite a few designers. Who are also composers, That's covering Dan Schreier's one, covering a lot of the, you know, sort of erasing that border there. Um, I try to now and then throw sound effects in just to just to annoy the sound designer. <laughs> <laughs> there was a reminder of a great transition that we had in the Heights, um, and it was actually Nevin's idea. Nevin, uh, when he was at Acme at the time, uh, had this idea where we had a, trans a transition that happened on stage, and it took us right to the scene that they were in the bodega. And it's like, Ned was like, wouldn't it be cool if as soon as that transition's over, the band stopped playing, and then you heard that very same music coming out of a little tinny radio inside the bodega. So we actually went into like the studio and recorded it, and they treated it so it sounded like it was coming out of this tiny AM radio. So that was an idea where, you know, that was a moment where the sound designer contributed to like the sound of the score. And it was a really cool moment, I thought. Yes. For, for submitting songs for orchestration, um, is piano vocal score like the epitome? I, I, for years, I've been writing lead sheets because I do a lot of work with different bands, and that's what seems to uh, work the best. And if you have, let's say, every most of my recordings are four or five piece. I do a lot of rock and pop and Latin music, and so most of the recordings I, I've, I've made of my songs have like rhythm section, and then basically rhythm section. Um, with some guitar licks that I feel add to the feel of it. So two questions. If you have um, one or two riffs in a song that you feel help to reflect the feel of it, um, does, that, does that confuse the orchestra or does that take away from being open-ended enough for you to deal with it? And um, secondly, what about lead sheets? Uh, um, I, I, I think there's always, you always take whatever input you can get. Um, I did uh, Next to Normal and with, with Tom Kitt, the composer, and Tom co-orchestrated because he'd been doing these songs for many years with his band. And so a lot of the rhythm se section stuff was worked out and he wanted a lot of it. Some of it was notated, some of it wasn't. Um, and he knew he's great with rhythm sections. And so there was no point in me like saying, no, I'm gonna throw it away, I'm gonna start from scratch. Why? I mean, he, he's the composer, he knows what he wants. If you have work that really contributes to what your song is doing, of course you should pass it on. You should not say, this has to be in, this, because then you're not collaborating. You should come to your orchestrator and say, I feel this kind of lick is really kind of what the song is. I'd love the guitar to be doing something like mm -hmm. this. I'd love it. But absolutely, bring, bring your work to the table. And any good orchestrator should, should be open to it. You should be open to him saying, yeah, but I think this is happening, and maybe we can bring it in the second verse. Because one of the great things an orchestrator will do will be to layer your song, particularly if you're working in a pop style, to not crash in so quickly in the style, but build to that style. And so to, if you're open to the give and take, you're the final arbiter as a composer. But, and as far as the lead sheet, um, 
if it's again if it's a rhythm tune i don't want a written out drum part and guitar part that becomes so difficult sometimes and so a lead sheet for that kind of music would be fine and the bass notes would be notated too sure G or G or B or yeah yeah and uh you know like michael said if you have riffs or ideas absolutely write them down and you know if there's something that we I would have an idea of, I would definitely come to you and say, hey, you know, what about if it, this one note changed? Like, what would you think of that? Like, it's, like Michael said, it's a collaborative art form, and at the end of the day, the orchestrators are really working for you. You know, you have to be happy about the end product. And it's a question of whether or not you want the input or uh, you want it to have it be, you know, meshed together with what you have. It's, it's about preference. At least it's a great. Uh, seriously, coming back to what I was saying as a joke before, if I rewrite one of Stephen's piano parts because I'm trying to do something, he has the option to come to me going, you know, I really miss that voicing. Let's put that back. And I will. But, you know, it, it lets me say to him, I'm doing this with the strings over here. I'm going to try and take this away to let that come through. But in the end, it's about him hearing the song that he wrote with my contribution, but it coming back to what he wants. But, but it's, it's, it's interesting, the more ingredients that you add, not only to a song or an orchestration, but to a show. You know, I, it's, it's something I think I learned from Graciela Danielle really early on, is that uh, certain times you know, a com composer can overwrite because you're just thinking of what you're hearing. And in fact, that you add choreography to it. And there was that one number in uh, Once in this Island where uh, I had a, a vocal counterline. It was where uh, it's the two different women and the, the guy, it's the, the sort of the central love triangle. And she, uh, for the other woman, just created this beautiful dance line. And I thought, well, you don't need that vocal at all. And I just took it out. And it's the same kind of thing working with an orchestrator or, or an arranger, because they bring other ideas to the table. And I'm thinking, well, that, you know, we don't need that anymore, because that other thing is accomplishing the same idea, you know. So it's getting the, the idea and the you know, the emotion across, but, you know, there are many different ways to do that, so. Thank you. I think, I think this may be is our, our last, yeah, okay, the, you're, you're the lucky last question. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is about Sibelius and Finale. Um, I'm a Sibelius user, but um, it seems like in Finale it's mostly used in the theater. Does it matter for the composer? Should they be using Finale? When it comes um, through this process you've been talking about, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about possible topics, and Emily said, I'll answer anything except the finale versus the baby. I'm happy to answer this question. Oh. <laughs> under the water. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, answer the question, no. The question, that, the question I didn't want to answer is which is better. Um, <laughs> th there is no which is better. But uh, the predominance is that theater people in New York still are using finale, and that seems to be what everybody started with and everybody's attached to. Uh, I, in my office, uh, I use both. Um, I, I would say that we're equally good at both programs. I would say that, the, but still, because more people are using finale, then more of our shows are still in finale. I would say easily 80% of the shows that I do for, you know, for, uh, well, for everybody, because the music comes to us in finale. But when I get a lot of the transfers from UK, everybody's using Sibelius, so we do those shows in Sibelius. If I were to be given a, a score on paper right now, I mean a handwritten score from somebody, and we're starting from scratch, which would I use? That's the debate, you know. Uh, probably we'd still use finale because we're, we, we do that, but really there are advantages to both. But I'd say that it's a matter of your collaborators. If your collaborators are all using Finale, then you know you might you have an issue. But there are you can there are translator programs now, and, and they, they work very very well. So it, it's less of an issue than it used to be. I mean, you can definitely one can talk to the other. So um, I, I don't know if it, it's I wouldn't counsel necessarily learning the other program. I think that Sibelius is you know, is a great program, and you know it's just a matter of who your collaborators are. So. As an orchestrator, I know that when I've been asked to work on a show that's in Sibelius, I simply say, okay, someone just has to set up, translate for me the piano vocal so I can paste it into my right. scores, and that's, and that's it. And, yeah. So. And when we post our finished scores on Dropbox for everyone to look at, we usually do a PDF at the same time so that everyone can see it. Well, I, I think it's been, it was so great that you could join us, uh, both here in the room and uh, on, on the, the feed, and uh, 
the only thing that, that worries me is that, that if we decide to do a technology and the composer three, that we're going to be doing like uh, chat, you know, like, <laughs> like FaceTime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This might be the last time we do that. But, you know. What's the good one? Uh, it was great. Oh, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you.